All right. Nice to see everybody for the first of the two days of the fall campus voting summit. This image, by the way, was created for us by a fellow from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design a couple of years ago, and I like it. So we're going to keep using it. But um, one of the things that we're talking more about in general in the campus voting sphere is using art, um, various forms of art to uh, both inspire people to vote, talk about the challenges that we're all facing in um, different areas of society. Um, and I like to think that's something we can continue in the future. Art as protest, of course, has been around since the beginning of time. So um, very interesting subject and maybe we can explore that again later in the fall. So uh, this is uh, the first of the two days. Um, Welcome, I'm Kristen Hansen. I am the state coordinator. Most of you know also Noah Foster, who is the deputy state coordinator this semester. He is on here, um, you'll see him later, and you, you all know him, I think. Um, and uh, we are going to um, have a lot of points today where we're actually having a discussion. So I hope nobody will be too shy to speak up when we get to that point. The point of a summit is to have an actual conversation. So we're gonna hope that we can do that. We're gonna talk about a little bit of voter registration. Most of you have done the election law training with me already. Um, if you haven't, you will. So I'm just gonna to touch on a few things that are very specific to students and that have changed recently. Then um, our student advisory board member, Roy Thorson from UW Stevens Point is gonna talk about voting accessibility, making sure we all understand that everyone has the right to vote and we need to make that possible. My friend Carmen from Every uh, Ask Every Student is gonna pop in later and um, talk about what that program offers to all of you for resources. Um, you'll see when she shows you the website is really, really thorough, very engaging, lots of stuff for you to learn there as you do this work, both for administrators and for fellows. And um, they are also a source of financial funds for the campuses, so that's good to know. We're gonna talk about um, how we maintain our nonpartisanship. We're gonna talk about some student motivation that we've learned about recently in focus groups. Tomorrow, we're gonna make a much deeper dive into those results of that focus group, and I hope you'll find it as fascinating as I did. And then we'll take what we've learned through all of this and talk about how we could use that to strategize with our events that are be coming up. So first of all, I did again want to um, emphasize that a summit is a meeting of top officials. That's us, that's us. We're all top officials in Wisconsin for campus voting. Um, but I do not want to just listen to myself talk this whole time. So um, do be thinking about what you can do to join the conversation. You're all muted right now, but when I do ask for questions and comment, obviously you can unmute yourself and share. Um, so here's a quick voting refresh of what's changed and what hasn't. First of all, um, and this is something that I think we're gonna have to really uh, continue to talk about on campuses. The Higher Education Act of 1965 says this, this is an exact uh, statement from the act. The institution that's covered, that means receive some kind of financial um, or other support from the US government, which is all of them. It doesn't matter if you are a, a private institution or a public institution, if the school receives any kind of interaction with the government, it's considered a government covered institution. This can include, you know, you have students that get Pell Grants, you have students that get other kind of federal financial aid, you have you know, any interaction with the government, it's kind of hard to not be a covered institution. You have to make voter registration widely available to students. So um, while we do, we're starting to feel a little bit of pushback because of um, you know, uh, election conspiracies that are going on, unfortunately, right now, um, we will push back when we have to and say, no, actually your campus does have to help students register to vote. So um, we will keep pushing that. We have the law on our side. This is the other law that we have on our side. As a college student, you can register and vote either from your campus home or your family home. You have the choice, not both, obviously, but 
Um, no one can tell you you have to pick one or the other. That is your choice. That's why on our website at campusvoteproject.org, we have that lovely map that has the voting rules in every state. So if you are not from Wisconsin and you want to vote from your home address, you can go uh, onto that state and find out what the rules are back at your home. If you are going to do that, I suggest you do it very soon because some of you might be in states where voter registration ends really early. We're lucky in Wisconsin that we can register to vote on the day of the election, but that is not true in a lot of states. And in fact, some of them, if you're not registered to vote by the middle of October, you can't vote. So um, make sure you understand that, check for yourself and check for your friends. Um, there's, again, this is a little bit wordy, but I think most of you know this already, and we will be talking a lot more about this tomorrow with the My Vote website. If you're from Wisconsin, you can register and vote on myvote.wi.gov uh, with your driver's license or ID. If not, you have to use paper and mail it in, or you can go directly to the clerk and do it. Sometimes there's people who pop up on the um, campus that help you, the from the League of Women Voters. Sometimes the clerks have little pop-up voting stations. Um, or you can just wait until you go to vote on the day of the election or vote early, bring the stuff you need, and then go ahead and register and then vote at the same time. So um, we are very lucky that we have all of these opportunities here. But if you are not from Wisconsin, again, you have to have some kind of ID. Oftentimes that is a um, voter version of your campus ID if your campus ID doesn't already count for voting. And um, a lot of details about that, we can give you those um, lists, but you would know um, whether your ID is usable for voting or not, because if it has your signature, um, an issuance date and an expiration date, in addition to your name and photo, then you can use it for voting. If it doesn't have that, you have to go get one from your campus that is usable for voting. Um, but at any rate, we're gonna make sure you all can vote and we're gonna make sure that you know how to help anyone else on your campus vote. These are all the deadlines that are coming up. These will be drilled into your head over the next couple of weeks. So um, October 19th is the online or mail um, deadline for voting. November 4th is your deadline to register with your clerk. Um, and then of course the day of the election. So we're good. Plenty of places for you to get all of these resources. If you ever have any questions about any of this, you can ask me, you can ask Noah, um, and you can call the uh, wonderful hotline. The voter um, protection hotline is 866-HOUR-VOTE. You can always call there and um, get any information that you need or talk through maybe a concern you have about something. Um, so that is all good information for you. We will send you this slide deck, by the way, so you don't have to scramble and write things down. This is what I was talking about. The college IDs that are usable as voter IDs in the state of Wisconsin would have your picture, your name, your signature, an issuance date, and an expiration date that is not more than two years after the date of issuance. Now, an obvious question is, a lot of you are on four-year campuses, um, and it's not unusual to take five years to graduate. Why would there be a two-year expiration date on here? Good question. Uh, I have suspicions about that, but fact is that is the law. It has been challenged. It was upheld. However, one thing that we were able to do with lawsuits against this is get them to lift the requirement that if you have this card and it is still valid, it is unexpired, you do not also have to show proof of enrollment. If it is expired, like poor Bucky Badger here, his card expired in 2021, you can still use it, but you have to bring proof that you are still enrolled. And that is a tuition statement, something on um, your personal like version on your uh, campus website that says something about um, uh, how you are still a student. There's a lot of different ways to prove enrollment. Um, so if you are the campus ID is expired, use it. If not, you are okay, and you can just use that ID to vote. Couple of changes, no more drop boxes. We've talked about this a little bit. 
Um, so if you want to go drop your ballot off, if you get one in the mail and you choose to vote that way, you can either actually mail it or you can uh, drop it at your clerk's office during their regular hours. You can drop it at your polling place, but you can't, there is no such thing as a drop box anymore. Um, if you do vote by mail or, a, or want to drop your ballot off, Make sure your witness writes their complete address on your mail-in ballot. There's lines, they're actually highlighted in yellow, it says the witness signs here, witness address has to be the whole address. Street address, city, state, zip. Everything else is what you're used to. If, you, this, is the, if this is the first time you're gonna be voting, we can talk a lot more in detail about that tomorrow. And as I said, we talk about that during our election law training. Um, we will recommend that you vote early. You can vote starting October 25th. Uh, voting um, places and hours vary according to the municipality you live in, the city or town. But if you um, look up that information, you'll get lots of different options about when you can go and vote early. And then you can work at the polls because you'll be free on election day. Or you can do um, election observing through the League of Women Voters. Lots of different things that you can do if you go ahead and take care of that vote early. And then, of course, actual election day, November 8th. It's kind of fun to go on that day. So we're going to switch now over to Roy. Um, Roy, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Um, we'll start here. Awesome. So I'm going to be doing a presentation today, um, which I titled Voting is for Everyone. I think that it's really crucial for us to get this idea in our heads and then understand how we can kind of implement this idea in our efforts as we uh, register people to vote and then do some other voter engagement efforts. So I wanted to give you a bit of information about me. Um, I am a senior at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point campus. Uh, for the last two semesters, I was a democracy fellow and then now I am a member of the Student Advisory Board through Campus Vote Project. And we essentially work on a national level to help um, the efforts that you guys are doing at your individual campuses. So I'm familiar with the work you guys are doing. I love doing this work. And um, I think that it's, it's interesting and noble work to be done. Um, but today I'm speaking to you a little bit more in my capacity also as a disabled voter. Um, I have a disability where I am in a wheelchair. So I have a real life understanding um, of how some accessibility concerns are definitely relevant to voting, um, especially for college students. So I hope to kind of bring some of that real life experience in. Today, I'm going to discuss disabilities and their relevance to voting. Um, we'll get into like the definition of disability and then how this can impact um, student voters in regards to their voting experience. I will then discuss the current accommodations that we have in place. Um, we together will kind of assess, you know, whether or not those are enough and whether or not we're meeting the needs that are present. Um, and then I'm going to discuss, you know, what you can do walking away from here to kind of help with these issues. So when we look at disabilities, um, the most relevant piece of legislation for a definition is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And this act details a disability to be a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one or more major life activities. So when we move away from like the, the legal jargon and reasoning behind this, what I really want you guys to take away is that it's not necessarily visible. Um, there are disabilities that you don't see, um, such as, you know, a hearing impairment or a vision impairment you may not be aware of at the start. Um, you know, there are those more common, like a wheelchair that you're familiar with, but it extends beyond that. Uh, I put a little picture here of a broken bone to even signify that it may be a temporary disability that a college student has. You know, you may be out playing some tennis and break a leg, um, and that is gonna impact your voting experience and fall under disabilities, um, and therefore bring into question some of these accommodation issues. So when we look um, at the national level, we have a lot of legislation in place to help with disability-related voting um, and accessibility issues. And that is the Help America Vote Act, the Voting Accessibility for Elderly and Handicapped Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I think it's important to look at these and realize what the goals of them are. Um, and that first one is equal access. 
So I think, you know, it's very easy for the average individual to walk into a polling location and vote. Um, but it is a lot different to have someone with a disability or an impairment that makes life harder and affects those everyday activities to vote. So having this equal access is the first key. Um, the second one I think is independence. You know, it's really nice to have a vote be completely yours. Um, it is up to you. And I think that these pieces of legislation go to try and help with that. Um, and again, we'll assess how well they do a bit later, but that's key too. And then key number three is a representative democracy. Um, our whole system is reliant on people voting and then those votes being counted towards the people that represent us. So if we have a democracy where people with disabilities can't vote, it is not representative and therefore our democracy is not doing its job. So I think that's key number three is that we have a representative democracy. Now in place, we have some accommodations and I wanna highlight some of these. Uh, so the first one is electronic voting. And essentially what this looks like is it's a bigger screen um, with a key touchpad for like moving up, down, left, and right, and then a select button, which allows somebody to do this instead of marking on the actual ballot. Um, a sheet then prints out and you take this sheet and put it into the ballot machine. It's personally a system I've used. It works pretty well, honestly, um, but this is something that should be available at every polling location. Then number two, this seems kind of basic, um, but it's really important and that's an accessible location. So this means, you know, access for wheelchairs with a lack of stairs. Um, an, an example Kristen was telling me last week was that there was a polling location that had stairs and it had an elevator option as well, but this draws serious questions about accessibility. If the elevator breaks down, all of a sudden someone in a wheelchair may not have the ability to vote. And that's quite frankly, just is not acceptable. Um, the third one is personal assistance, and this ties into the fourth one, which is poll worker assistance. So the reason that you may need assistance is completely irrelevant. You absolutely have the right to help um, or to have someone help you vote at the polls. You can bring someone along that you know, and that's not a problem, or you can ask a poll worker for assistance if no one else is available. So you absolutely have that right um, to have someone help you vote, whether it's marking the ballot, whether it's getting in the location, anything like that. Um, and the last one is accessible ballots. This is kind of a broad idea, um, but it can stem to things like language. It can stem to things like Braille. Um, but ultimately, you need to have an accessible ballot that you can have access to and understand. So now I want to open it up for a little bit of discussion, um, like Kristen had talked about. And I want to know from you guys, you know, is this enough? Do you think these accommodations meet the needs we're having? And if so, you know, why? Um, do you maybe have an example or something like that? Feel free to unmute yourselves and share. Can anyone think about a place they've been, even if it's not a polling place, where you thought to yourself, boy, if I, have, if I was on crutches from a broken leg or something, I would not be able to get into this place. I personally think that when we think about voting and marginalized communities who might not be able to vote, I know personally, from what I've heard and what I understand, I feel like the disabled community is sometimes kind of left behind and left out of that conversation. And so I think just kind of raising awareness that this is an issue is very important. And like I'm even thinking about on Tuesday, I did voter registration on my campus and it was just me and another person and I don't know what would have happened if somebody who was blind or if somebody who was deaf came up because neither of us could do sign language and, you know, our voter sheets weren't in Braille. And so just kind of making sure that these able options are, or these accessible options are just the norm and that it's normalized throughout all polling places and even for voter registration as well. That is a really good example. Um, especially as uh, we're hoping a lot of you will be helping others register to vote this fall. Um, you know, is it enough to have a flyer that you can hand them that they can take back to when they're in a situation where someone can read it and help it and help them with it? Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's a really good point. I'm almost wondering if we should um, enlist someone to do um, American Sign Language over our voter registration training 
because then you can send that video out to anyone who might need it. Really good ideas. Anyone else? Christian. Um, yeah, so I think there's something to be said about uh, more than just the, the voting experience itself, um, and also about, especially as we inform people about voting, um, the, the resources that they'll need to vote. So for example, uh, acquiring like a voting ID from your school. At my school, for example, you have to go down like two flights of stairs just to get that. And it's not really something that you can ask a friend to do. So, um, I mean, if there are any, you know, uh, people with disabilities that would prevent them from going down the stairs, for example, I'm not really sure what to tell them. Uh, that is really an sure excellent question. Where do you go to school, Christian? At Marquette University. All right. Well, we will need to look into that because that's that's exactly what we're talking about. Exactly. We will find an answer. That is a really good point. Anyone else? Yeah, um, to kind of build on what Taryn was saying earlier, I think there's also improvements to be made within actually the training of poll workers. Um, like speaking from experience myself, I I was doing poll working in an area that was pretty diverse and very large in population, but um, when it actually came around to early voting and voting day, there was really nobody on site for people that if someone with a disability or even if someone wasn't an English speaker didn't have someone along with them to help them, there wasn't really anybody available to them that could, you know, speak American Sign Language or assist them if they were blind. So just having more people actually in polling stations that are equipped to handle people with disabilities or non-English speakers, I think is really important. And maybe that's not the case everywhere. Maybe it's just where I was that we didn't have those resources, but it was still discouraging to see that we couldn't help those people every time. You know, that's a really, those are the really good points too, Zoe. Um, I know that at one of the polling stations um, here where I live in Waukesha that um, has a, a higher Latino population, they do have two bilingual poll workers at that station or at that location, but that's the only location I know of that has that. The clerk's office has someone who speaks many languages just by coincidence, she works there. So that's good. But their, their idea is that if someone would come in and need language help, the chief inspector would have to call the clerk. The clerk would send someone over or talk to them on the phone or something. So it's not a perfect system. I mean, um, that's just a, another really good, a really good point. Another reason why we need to recruit more bilingual poll workers. Um, so that's a, a really good point. Thank you, Zoe. Anything else before we move on? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, I think some folks in the room, virtual room, I already mean, know I'm very passionate about improving access to voting for folks with disabilities. Um, and uh, we at the, I, I, my name is Carmen Nero Lopez. I actually work for the Students Learn Students Vote Coalition. And one of our missions this year was to create a guide for ex improving uh, accessibility. And so I just popped it in the chat. I highly recommend y'all check it out. One of the, and I wanted to share my first experience seeing this was the way that um, conventional organizing always demands that folks be, uh, when you're like tabling or clipboarding, that people be standing. And I realized that that really got in the way, not just of folks who were literally in wheelchairs, but lots of folks can't stand for extended periods of time. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is something that is fundamentally wrong with our system. And then the more I learned, the more I found that there were lots of things that we could be doing to improve democratic engagement efforts across the board. Uh, so this is our small effort to uh, make um, events, whether they're virtual or in-person, to make websites, to make resources, and so on, more inclusive. Uh, and uh love to talk more about that. Uh, thank you so much, Roy, for talking about this today. 
And that's actually a really good segue into the next section of the webinar, which is with Carmen. So I am going to reshare my screen. Oh, sorry, Roy's not done. Roy, finish your part first. I was wondering if I went over on time too much. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, those are some great insights. I really like those. And I'm glad to see that we're being cognizant of that in society. So I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I wanted to highlight a recent concern that Kristen kind of already brought up, which is the Teagan versus Wisconsin Elections Commission's case. Um, this was a Wisconsin Supreme Court case recently handed down um, to the state of Wisconsin regarding the drop boxes and regarding other people handling your ballot. Um, and this case ruled that, you know, no one else can hand in your ballot. You cannot have drop boxes, which is unfortunate um, for the whole population, but it's even more relevant to those people with disabilities. Um, you know, the Voting Rights Act and whatnot allow people with disabilities to have help. So as a disabled person, someone can hand in my ballot. Yet this um, court case decides opposite of that and contrary to federal law. So there are currently cases going through um, the court system to kind of help clarify this. But I think it goes to show that not a lot of people in society are either aware of or that interested in those accessibility concerns. So this, I just think, goes to show kind of the overall theme of what we've been saying um, regarding accessibility concerns. Absolutely. And then I kind of want to do a little call to action here. Um, when I was making this presentation, my main goal was for you guys to walk away knowing a little bit more or one extra thing about accessibility um, than when you came here. And I know that's true for me. Um, I brought up about like the tabling events, a lot of stuff I had never thought about, about the tabling events we do at Stevens Point. Um, so I can say that's true for me. Um, and I hope it's true for you as well. So now my call to action is go away and use some of this. Um, you know, make a more accessible event at your campus, um, help someone out on, you know, a election day, tell them what their rights are, help them cast their ballot, because um, ultimately each little step we take is helping a person vote, and that's why we're all here. Thank you so much, Roy. That was really great, um, and I think you did give everyone something to think about, and all of us some things that we need to make some adjustments in how we're helping folks register and vote and even how we're doing events on campus, which we're gonna talk more about um, later this afternoon. Um, and now we will segue over to Carmen. Um, this again, makes a lot of sense with what we were just talking about. How can you make sure that you literally are asking every student whether they want to register to vote? And Carmen, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so, hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Carmen Lunar Lopez and I'm the program manager for Ask Every Student. This is a, a national joint initiative of the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, my employer, uh, but we're also led by the Campus Vote Project. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sitting on our steering committee and for having me here today. NASPA and the All on Campus Democracy Challenge. Today, I'm gonna share a couple of different tools, not next slide yet. Uh, <laughs> Oh, today I'm going to share a couple of different tools um, about how you can level up your efforts um, and by using the tools and frameworks. Uh, but first, start at the beginning. We are literally called Ask Every Student because we were aiming literally to ask the question, what would it take to ask every student at my, at your, at our institution to participate in our democracy? This is a question that your institution is literally legally obligated to ask itself, as Kristen mentioned at the beginning of our time together today, by the Higher Education Act. So we set upon uh, answering this question by building this community of practice, this who is Ask Every Student. The Ask Every Student community of practice involves students, faculty, administrators, volunteers, nonprofit professionals, and more. We collaborate with and support more than 285 campuses across 40 states in the District of Columbia. And we do so alongside 50 national nonprofits, including those, or plus those four amazing steering committee organizations. Our nonprofit partners range from the large national organizations with local representatives like we see here, 
and to small local community-based nonprofits. And the campuses we work with, uh, a lot of your campuses here today are campuses that we work with, but really there's no campus that's too big or too small, too uh, rural or too urban, uh, all institutions, uh, minority serving institutions, um, wherever, whatever your campus looks like, we work with folks like you. Collectively, the campuses we work with actually enroll more than 4 million students. So we're definitely talking about one of, about several of uh, many, many thousands of those students. For example, one out of every five college students is a disabled student. One out of every five students is a Latinx student. Last month was Disability Awareness Month. This month is Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, all of those folks are represented in our campuses. So whatever you learn today, make sure to keep in mind that we're using those uh, strategies across the board and they work to literally ask every student. So next slide, please. I won't spend a lot of time going over what the different levels of participation mean because I heard most folks here today are students who might be interested in getting some inspiration uh, for actions to implement on their campuses. Nonetheless, briefly, I'll share it, that anyone can join the Ask Every Student community, which allows folks to learn about anything going on across the Ask Every Student space, whether it's a focus group, a training, a design session, or funding opportunities. Um, and then that it, you can join that by being part of a community cohort. If you're interested in receiving funding for your campus, and by the way, we do still have a little bit of funding left for this cycle, uh, you can do that by being a part of the commitment cohort. And then finally, campuses can join our co-designer cohort. And these are the folks who are leading the development of resources I'll be talking about today to hopefully give y'all some inspiration. So uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide, please. Uh, before I jump specifically into those resources, I wanna share a bit about the framework through which we envision your campuses applying these tools. When we started talking about asking every student, we wanted to find ways to seamlessly integrate voter registration into existing processes on your campus so that campus partners could equitably reach every student. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. If there's something happening on your campus that already touches every student, like, I don't know, maybe classes, <laughs> that would be a great place to ask every student. Uh, maybe you're a commuter campus. Does every student either get a bus pass or a parking pass? That's an, that's an excellent way to seamlessly integrate. But then, fine, you find those places to integrate these tactics. How do you execute these conversations? Well, our tools also help you execute inclusive, individualized voter registration and nonpartisan democratic engagement conversations. Uh, we're not only, we focus on voter registration, but we're also aware that that's not the only way that folks can participate in our democracy. And we're also aware that that's not the only way that many people, or that's not an option to many people uh, for participating in our democracy. So executing these conversations, we're really talking about building inclusive conversations. And then finally, we wanna make sure these tactics are institutionalized so they can be a sustainable part of your campus culture that lasts, for decades and generations to come. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, before I, uh, again, before I jump into who, all these specific tactics, I wanted to give a shout out to the 2022 co-designer cohort. These are the folks who helped us design resources in the last year. We have co-designer cohorts every year. And you can see in our map that we actually have never had a co-designer campus from Wisconsin. So I guess 2023, the ball's in your court, Wisconsin. Who is gonna be up on this map next year? But major I will be pushing that hard. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Oh, and of course I have to plug it. How can you learn about these resources? You're get, as Chris mentioned, you're gonna get all these slides, but also you can always check it out at studentvoting.org. Thanks so much. Next slide. The way that we break down our resources is by six integration categories. 
first we have academic integration. So building it into the classroom, building in the course registration process. And I'll, and I'll jump into specific tactics in a second. We also have student life integration, student leadership opportunities, institutional partnerships. And finally, uh, we have resources created by our campus or uh, organizational partners. We call those engagement resources. And we have trainings in human-centered design. The way that we design all of our resources is using human-centered design. And that involves a, a flat time consuming process that involves speaking to students, speaking to your audience and receiving feedback and uh, having in-depth conversations on, on analyzing the problem, discovering the problem. And next slide, please. This is actually uh, human-centered design. We can see some examples from the Metro State University Denver, for example, where they hosted uh, human-centered design sessions in the classroom. Those were basically like focus groups where they began by identifying the problem. Why wasn't every student registering to vote? Why were students finding it so hard, et cetera? Um, we also worked with the University of Central Florida to develop different engagement profiles. This is part of the human-centered design process, which you can learn a lot about by visiting our website and taking and watching our, our videos of training um, on how to do this. And I highly recommend that in order to customize all of the resources I'm about to share with you, you first check out human-centered design to make sure that the resources that I'm sharing and maybe the resources you already have on your campus actually work for the real life human beings that you're talking to. So next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the different strategies. This is where you can identify the partners, processes, and strategic direction you want to take in order to actually ask every student on your campus to participate. So maybe uh, the easiest place for you to start would be through academics, maybe through student life like clubs or sports. Uh, maybe you already have a team of incredible student leaders. How can you better prepare those student leaders to have these conversations and to lead the way? And then maybe you're not uh, connecting with everyone on campus or everyone in your larger community. You might wanna check out institutional partnerships. Let's jump to the next slide and start with academic integration. I'm gonna go just basically read here through a list of the different resources and give you a little bit of a hint about what they are like and what they look like, uh, but highly recommend you head to the website to learn more. And at the end of this presentation, you'll see a slide and I'll share my contact information and our human-centered designer, our uh, resources and campus support manager, Maddie Wolf's information who can help you really customize these resources for your campus. But anyway, back to academic integration. Number one, a faculty champions guide. You wouldn't believe the amount of interest we've received from this from campuses who want to engage with their faculty, but they're not really sure how to start the conversation or if they've already started the conversation asking their faculty to bring voter registration voter education into the classroom, but it hasn't gone super well. Well, uh, something like the Voter Champions Guide might be the way to do it. Uh, and then Miami-Dade College by uh, developed a very specific course um, with, that trains their faculty in how to do this. Uh, so you can also check out the real lived example from Miami-Dade College. And then uh, other campuses held focus groups with their faculty and uh, sent out a bunch of surveys to find out what kind of work worked for their faculty. So you can also learn about what the faculty on your campus might be more receptive to, because it really varies a lot, like depending on the type of campus, depending on the workload of the professor, you might want to have a couple of different levels of engagement. Additionally, for actual in the classroom engagement, we've developed a Canvas-based learning management system module. Anybody, whether or not your campus uses Canvas, can access the can Canvas, can Canvas Commons uh, to see the learning mod management system module, and you can actually duplicate it and bring it to your own campus, whether you use Blackboard or whatever LMS system you all use. And then, 
We also have the guide that Columbia College Chicago uses for their class visits. Columbia College Chicago enrolls between six and 7,000 students a year. And in their in uh, last year in 2021, during their first semester efforts, they actually registered 1,645 students through these class visits. So you got to check out their strategies. They really work. Um, and part of their strategies were by using presentations and the civic engagement packet that helped students figure out how they should be or how they plan to engage civically, whether or not it was just with voter registration. Maybe they also wanted to volunteer. Maybe they wanted to volunteer with the elections office or even more in a partisan way any way that they wanted to participate, a civic engagement packet presents all of those options. Finally, really important and really uh, rising that we're seeing in uh, the academic integration is voter registration as an option of, as a part of the course registration process. Micah, the Maryland Institute College of Art has actually been working on this for over two years. And they uh, figured out the first year that it didn't actually go so well when they tried to ask students to register to vote after they had finished uh, the course registration process. They found that a lot of students didn't actually respond very well to course registration after they, or to voter registration after they hadn't gotten into the classes that they wanted. And I think that this is a problem that occurs in a lot of places. A lot of campuses aren't actually able to, you know, or a lot of students aren't actually able to get every class that they want. So at the end of the process, does it make a lot of sense to then also ask them to register to vote? Maybe not. And what, uh, their, what the school was then able to do is make it a part of the uh, course, uh, catalog process. So in order to access the course catalog, they had to uh, acknowledge that they had seen and been uh, able to register to vote if they wanted. I'm so sorry. Can you guys hear the lawnmower? No? Okay, great. I'll just keep yelling then. Uh, I just want to make sure you can hear me. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Thank you so much. And then now we have student life integration. Uh, student life integration has been really successful uh, at Stony Brook University as part of their orientation integration. And they have actually done 100%. I'm sorry, this one, one second, please. We can hear you just fine. Sorry, they just now started right next to us. Anyway, sorry about that, you guys. Wow, sometimes life, ha, huh? okay. <laughs> Back to student life integration. All right, so huge shout out to Stony Brook University in New York, which actually had a 100% rate of asking students through their orientation integration process. And a big way they were able to do that is by first achieving 100% student athlete registration. So I highly recommend you check out their tool on our website to learn how to involve athletes, how to integrate it as part of orientation and how to achieve 100%. Um, yeah, I know, I'm like still super amped about it. <laughs> uh, and then also as part of student life integration, we created a voting as a student 101 presentation that any student can take and add uh, and use in any part of student life. So maybe like presenting it to a club, presenting it to their sports team, presenting it to like a fellowship group on campus, or even in their class, their own class. Uh, so that, fellow, that presentation, which we've had on our website since 2020, has been one of the most popular resources. So I highly recommend everyone check it out. And then uh, last part of student life integration, we have a civic engagement packet that folks can use, anybody can use 
print a couple copies or just do virtually to help students plan out, again, offering different ways to engage civically beyond voter registration. So student life integration prepares students, faculty, uh, and other campus leaders to bring in the voter registration and democratic engagement process all across the student life board. Oh my God. You, uh, next slide, please. All right, student <laughs> leadership opportunities. Um, I'm actually very excited about these in part because for me, it was a big discovery earlier this year. I don't know if this, the pandemic time, maybe it was this year, maybe it was three years ago. I'm not sure, but a couple of time ago, I did a bunch of research on how federal work study works. And it turns out that uh, the federal government actually requires that 7% of federal work study funds be used for civic or community engagement. So your campus, FWS jobs should at least 7% of them be about engaging with the community or engaging civically. And one of our campuses, Northampton Community College in Northampton, Pennsylvania, actually was able to rev revolutionize their federal work study program by learning that this was the law. Uh, and the ways that it, that law works, um, and then how they actually execute it by having the job poster, the recruitment flyer, interview questions, and then just the day-to-day -day responsibilities of those students uh, is all part of our federal work study toolkit. On the other hand, there are uh, schools that maybe you're not ready to have like the staff to manage the federal work study employees, right? So maybe it'd be better to have something like voting ambassadors that have uh, fewer responsibilities. So Carnegie Mellon University, what they did was actually uh, create an opportunity for like 30 students rather than a few students to take um, a, a, to make a commitment and a, receive a small stipend to work about 10 hours over the course of the whole year. They spent two hours taking a training class during which they also received a free lunch. And then they, uh, during the, those two hours, they learned how to register voters and how to make classroom announcements. And then they served as ambassadors in their own existing lives and communities. So they didn't have to like do anything new. They didn't have to go to any new classes. They didn't have to join any new clubs. They didn't have to make announcements to any new sports teams. They just served as ambassadors in their own community. So whether you want to give students leadership opportunities that go from the, you know, a regular semester long position to an occasional, um, just a 10 hour for the whole year commitment. Uh, these are some great resources available, whether you want to implement them this year, next year. Hey, FAFSA and federal work study, that's been federal law for a long time. And you can bet it's also going to be next year. And then finally, also as part of the student life or student leadership opportunities, we have been working with the incredible uh, Minnesota-based Lead MN on an online platform that uh, trains students to be activists in their communities. So this is very similar to what I mentioned earlier about the learning management system module that uh, provided information more in the, um, like specifically about voting. This training resource provides information about how to be an activist, how to be an organizer. Uh, and has template slides and a conversation guide. So head to our website to check it out and you can integrate that in your training of the volunteers on your campus or maybe even to augment your own training as an organizer or an activist. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, our last section of um, uh, integration is through institutional partnerships. Number one, coalition building. 
my goodness, coalitions. They are very hard to build. They are very hard to maintain, but they are so important for success on your campus. And I'm seeing a couple of head nodding. And I think that's because I can imagine folks have had some experience, maybe at a difficulty of launching or especially now in the, uh, we come back to campus after the pandemic with actually maintaining these coalitions because the clubs that were leading them may not have sustained throughout the pandemic. Yeah. So here we have 10 comprehensive campus coalition case studies, including a successful one from Weber State University from beginning to end, and uh, especially how they made sure that their coalition is equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, so we have these case studies, these uh, guiding specifically in diversity, and finally, um, on the actual activities that may need to take place in order to accomplish it, just partnership mapping and outreach. And then shout out to our uh, steering committee organization and one of the major tools to get senior leadership, the all-in higher education president's commitment, full student voter participation. Cannot plug them enough. If your school doesn't have a, a lot of like higher up leadership support, uh, we we will connect you with our partners at All In. They're so good at that sweet talk. I don't know how they do it, but they get presidents to sign up all the time. And once the president signs up, it's pretty good leverage to get everyone else to do it too. Finally, uh, from Clark Atlanta University and Virginia Tech University, we have case studies on partnering with different folks right on your campus. Uh, Virginia Tech on how to integrate voter registration across different parts of campus and how to make sure that the integration was comprehensive, uh, both in terms of having a lot of information and comprehensive full so that students could actually understand it. And then from Clark Atlanta University, on how to partner with registrars. So that's the folks who enroll students on different classes on your campus. And the registrars have access to so much information. At Clark Atlanta, this case study is really worth the read because they actually got their registrar to give them contact outreach information for every student on campus. And they were able to reach out individually to each student as part of the course registration process, but have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue. So all of these ideas, you can find them all on our website. Next slide, please. As well as a couple of different ideas that just like didn't really fall into any of those categories, but are really awesome and really successful uh, from Miami-Dade College, the Civic Action Scorecard. My goodness, you wouldn't believe how help, how competitive people can be <laughs> and it really works. I, am not gonna lie, when they came to me with this idea, I was like, no, like everyone, we just all love to just be together, voting together and no competition worked. Also, major shout out to Emma Godell from American University who on her own as a graduate student actually went major by major and developed a really comprehensive guide to why it's important to vote regardless of your major. Whether you're an engineer, obviously, I think we all know that STEMs, STEM students often are, are some of the lower turnout students. That does not have to be the way. Uh, check out your major on the ballot by Emma Godell. And then uh, from Cuyunga Community College, I don't know if any of y'all were on yesterday's coalition call, I'm going to dig it up in a second, but they have created an incredible music video uh, that with the voter rock the vote challenge. I'll drop it in the chat after I wrap up, uh, but they are just totally changing the student vote game by making it a TikTok challenge. Hey, if it works, it works. And then we also have resources from our partners like Vote for Astra and All In. So, uh, I believe that's the end of my presentation. Next slide. Yeah. 
uh, that's the, those are, that's like in 30 minutes, maybe a little bit over, sorry, Kristen, um, all of the resources we have, and I'm happy to talk to you more, and I'm happy to connect you, or you can reach out directly to Maddie, who led the, the actual step-by-step -step design of all of these resources. Like I said, of the 285 big, small, rural, urban, all of these campuses that enroll 4 million students, they all can find tools on our website. And I would love to hear how you're gonna implement some of our ideas, some new ideas, any effort to ask every student. And with that, do you have any questions or uh, comments for Carmen? That was a lot, and I know you need to take some time, but you should all go to studentvoting.org and poke around with those, those resources are really amazing. You might find that you're you know, reinventing the wheel, especially with the, um, the resource called your major on the ballot. You know, If you were gonna spend a lot of your time trying to figure out how every major has a connection to voting or the government or agencies and why it's important, Emma's done that for you, or at least started it. So um, very, very good. Any questions for Carmen? Okay, you all absorbed that. Oh, wait, Matt. Hello. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say two things. One, Carmen, thank you for all of his information, um, because I had never thought about the ways to do this at scale um, until this cycle. And so one of the things I'd share with this group is, um, so I moonlight in a lot of areas at Stritch, um, but I work um, with new student orientation programs. And so one of the things we did this year as part of our orientation registration uh, is all new students and all new transfer students were asked to provide information about their voter registration status. Um, which also now, and William is on this call and he doesn't know this yet, but he's going to start working on this next week, um, <laughs> is <laughs> that um, we now have really granular data to reach out to kind of broad cohorts of students to say, hey, like you're from the state of Illinois. And so would you, are you going to vote in Wisconsin? Are you going to vote at home? Are you are, oh, you're already registered. Like what's some information? Um, you know, where are you going to go? So I just, I would just say for folks who are, haven't utilized any of these resources or who haven't thought about this in this way, um, really think about it. Um, and don't think about it in terms of, I know Carmen just said this, but don't think about it in terms of like, you need to do all of these things across all of the spaces all of the time. Um, just this one little thing that we did in a form that we already were going to be sending out um, will hopefully provide us a lot of really good information and good supports for our students. Thank you, Matt. Does anyone else have questions or anything to add to this conversation? Okay, well, I hope you all wrote down Carmen's contact information. Um, if not, like I said, you're gonna get the slide deck and you can uh, contact her there. Um, but please do spend some time poking around on studentvoting.org because that was, um, it's just, there's so much there. Let the people do it for you and then take the resources they've created. They do this for a living. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Carmen. Have a wonderful weekend. All right. We are going to do one more segment and then we'll take a little break. Um, so the Fair Election Center and the Campus Vote Project is a program of the Fair Elections Center. Um, we did a, um, actually hired an organization to do a focus group study with some college students. Now, we will go into this data much, much deeper tomorrow in Madison. But I wanted to quickly, before we start talking about the events that you ultimately will do or social media campaigns or whatever you're you know, doing to literally um, inspire students to vote and get them to register to vote. What motivates them? What demotivates them? 
and what are the rules around what we can and cannot do as a nonprofit. So let's let's kind of set the table with this. So first, um, let's do the challenges first. Um, and again, we're going to learn a lot more about this tomorrow. But a full 41% of the students in this focus group said that the belief that voting doesn't change anything keeps them from voting. So we, the counter to that and what one of the many, many things that we can share that will persuade them that that's not true is that in 2020, we had the highest percentage of young voters ever, 66%. Now, as a loyal employee of the Campus Vote Project, I'm gonna tell you, I think that's due to us, but <laughs> ask every student all in, all of these great organizations helping students vote, has made a difference. So in 2020, we had the highest percentage of young voters ever, and the youngest and most diverse Congress ever was elected. You know, is that 100% causation? I don't know, but look, that's, the stats are there, right? Um, about half of the students believed that logistical barriers stopped them from voting. This was not only because they personally felt there's, a, there's gonna be some reason why I can't vote or there is a reason that I'm you know, unsure of how to get around this barrier. It was also a belief that their fellow students were not going to vote because it was too difficult. So it's kind of a double, um, a double problem there. So one of the things that we have going for us in Wisconsin is that website myvote.wi.gov is the official government website and it is so handy, so easy to use, has so much information on it. Um, one of the things we're gonna be talking about tomorrow is the resources that you can either create yourself on your campus or that we will create for you. Um, get that website out there. We can give you the QR code, um, you know, make it super easy. You could put it on stickers, you can put it on buttons, you can put it on cards to hand out. This is just the easiest thing that you can do. Now, for some folks, is it gonna take still some digging to, to figure out exactly how to register? Sure, but it's there. So we're really, really happy about that. Also, most if not all of the campuses in Wisconsin have a page on their websites dedicated to voter instruction and voter information. Um, that's very important. And we want all of the fellows to have business cards with their contact information that they can hand out when they do campus visits or tabling, but also have the links to my vote on there, the, you know, maybe the, the URL for the page on your, on your campus website. We'll figure that all out and we will print those business cards and have them shipped directly to you. Um, the other reason that students um, might not vote uh, is because they feel disconnected from their own elected officials. And they also are unsure about the candidate options. So you've got the folks who are currently in place, who are currently elected, who are supposed to be representing you as a constituent. And then you've also got the candidates that are your choices in, an, you know, in any particular election. Not sure about both of those things. So one of the things that campuses can do, and I know Cardinal Stritch did this recently, was to bring elected officials to your campus I think lacrosse also had some listening sessions. Current elected officials, invite them to come and have a conversation with some students, um, you know, so that you can really talk to each other, ask questions, they can understand your concerns, you can understand uh, the challenges they have as an elected official to really start to open up that whole relationship. Um, and then also to try to bring some of the candidates to campus. Um, there might be some who just, you know, you happen to hear there's going to be a rally or a, a debate or something that's happening on your campus. You can also work with your student Dems, your student Republicans, um, your associations that might, for whatever reason, want to bring a candidate in. The only thing you have to remember, which we'll talk more about later, is that if you're if you are involved with bringing a, a candidates to campus, or if you're going to share information about a candidate being on campus, 
you have to be fair about it. You can't, you know, you can't invite one party's candidate and not the other. Not saying they're always going to show up, but you at least have to extend the invitation. Um, and that is how we do that. Um, the other thing is, of course, helping students to see what we you know who what roles are you going to be voting for in November or October if you vote early. Um, what roles are you going to be voting for? Who are these candidates? What are your choices? Again, back to myvote.wi.gov, that website has where you can put in your address and look and see what your ballot literally looks like. So you can see, here's all the choices I'm going to have. Here's all the candidates. You can do your research ahead of time. Um, and there are some other websites that you can go to to get some unbiased information. Candidates, of course, have all their own websites. There's a lot of different ways. We'll talk more detail about that tomorrow. But um, directing students to where they can find the information is what you can do. You cannot tell them who to vote for, but you can help them figure out how they're going to figure it out. So um, if you want to unmute yourself or if anyone wants to drop something in the chat, for these three challenges in particular, is there, are there any other ways you can think of that we can overcome these? You'll forgive me, Kristen, uh, if I don't offer a solution here, um, <laughs> but but diagnose another potential challenge. Um, sure. uh, so last last spring, um, we invited two local legislators uh, to campus, um, both of whom represent the Appleton Fox Valley area, uh, a Democrat and a Republican who co-sponsored a bill in the Wisconsin Assembly uh, to introduce a, a new um, method for conducting elections that is very similar to what they do in Alaska. So it's a combination of an open primary and then ranked choice runoff voting in the general. Okay. Um, a topic that we fully expected students to engage with. Um, questions about uh, the, the future of democracy um, and, and the often illiberal nature of current election law. Um, we, we, we fully expected students to engage in, in this, this event. Um, I think we had like four students show up, uh, mm -hmm. but an incredibly healthy cohort uh, from the local chapter of the League of Women Voters, which was always nice to see. So I guess the question I would pose to the group is, even if we are bringing these events to campus, how do we get students to recognize the value in participating? Um, and I realized that like, finding the the cure-all to student engagement on a college campus is is the proverbial silver bullet that I'm sure we're all looking for. Um, but if anybody <laughs> has insights, I'd, I'd be deeply appreciative. What do you all think? Um, I'll jump in a little bit. Apologies, yeah. I have been sick this week. Um, so if I sound a little bit rough, that's why. Um, but um, that's, of course, a challenge I think we face on all of our campuses. Um, but a few things that can at least help push things along is thinking about, A, the way that you're advertising the event can make a big difference and where you're advertising the event. Um, the second part is thinking about uh, what is going to draw students to the event if it is not the topic itself. Um, and while we may see them as important um, and see the value in them, I think selling that point across can be a little bit difficult, especially when there are a lot of like competing events um, and things going on for students time. So some ways to sort of overcome that is offering a free lunch with the event um, that will incentivize students to go and hear the event um, and also feel like they're not taking time out of like their day and their time that they might only have an hour to like eat their lunch or whatever, um, or um, pairing up with some faculty members who are willing to give extra credit um, for attending these sort of events um, is a really good way to get students um, in the door and sort of spark that interest um, that they might not know that they had to begin with. I do like that idea of um, pairing with a faculty member or several. Um, and a really kind of fun challenge would be, can you get some non-obvious faculty to join in on something like this? Not just the political science professors, but any professor um, to get their students to participate. And we've got Matt Weiss and then Brianna. Yeah, I was going to say what uh, what Alana said. Um, when we did this in the spring, um, 
this past semester, we, um, trying to remember how exactly we, we got involved in that because it wasn't my choice. I remember that part. Um, <laughs> so, um, one of the things that we, we did though, is we went back to the officials and said, um, you know, we're going to run this at the same time as a, uh, a class in political engagement or something within our political science department. Um, and so we actually had multiple classes that were required to attend and then like write a reflection paper or like do a thing kind of related to their coursework with it. Um, and so I think that was really cool. Um, one of the other things that I think was really surprisingly effective for us um, when we were talking about it is I think we had to remind a lot of our students that elected officials are just like, they're real humans. Um, I think it's sometimes really easy to, to like, I think you see this in the way that we, we think about and t understand like politics as, um, as a hobby and kind of the, like the creation of like, pol like politicians as celebrity. Um, and I, it's, I think when students only think about it in those ways, they don't realize that like their representative lives right down the street from our campus. Um, and so it was kind of neat for them to be like, yeah, like I shop at this grocery store that's right across the street from your campus. Like, and I think it becomes more real for them, but I think having them get that reminder was really helpful um, and impactful when the event was happening. And I think when we would do that again in the future, I think finding ways to create that more humanness and like promote that humanness in a little bit of a different way um, would probably be a tactic that we would use. Brianna? Yeah, I had a situation with an event last week um, where a student brought, one student who is a connector and involved in a lot of student organizations is a student employee at a department on campus, brought a ton of um, their friends to our Constitution Day event. And I was fully prepared because again, we were fulfilling our federal requirement. Um, this was a lecture about the Constitution over lunch. There was free food, but I did not expect a lot of turnout just based on past response to these types of events. And this student brought a ton of friends and we had to pull in more chairs. And it was just really one person who was well-connected with various student groups on campus. Um, and so I thought, you know, could I be more strategic about that for future events and connecting with students that I know who are really involved, who might be willing to convince their friends to do things um, or, you know, uh, mobilizing some of our student employees, um, incentivizing them to come and bring your friends and that kind of thing. So I thought that that was, it surprised me in a pleasant way. And I was like, ooh, okay, how could we actually be purposeful about this in the future rather than having it be an accident? That's amazing. And that person should be a democracy fellow. <laughs> Let's get him on board. So how fun. Anyone else on this topic before we go back to the next slide? Yeah, I'd, I'd hammer in the point about student employees, like especially with RAs, like especially on UW Milwaukee, our campus is, the union isn't far from the dorms. And on a Wednesday night when nothing else is going on, if you get 10 RAs to come, they will bring residents. They will 100% bring residents and residents bring friends. All you got to do is network and talk to uh, campus housing and say, hey, uh, we're doing this event here. Can you get some RAs? Because RAs need event, quote unquote, events to like cover for their month. And they will gladly, gladly not host an event in their like common area and bring people somewhere else because that's less work they got to do and so if you're taking some weight off of their shoulders they will gladly bring people with i love that that's a really good idea chris if they've already got to do one and they're like oh what am i going to do for my event this month make one and tell them about it that's a really great really great idea anything else on this subject All right, let's go back. So that was the challenges. Now, what did we find out from this focus group about our opportunities? 
Um, so the, they, we, they said, what motivates you to work, to vote? And they answered when they've, that they're motivated to work when they're thinking about current issues, either out of anger or out of hope. Doesn't matter. Both of those emotions create motivation to vote. The top issues that this particular group of students was thinking about were inflation, abortion access, gun violence, and climate change. There are others. We will dig into those um, tomorrow. Those just happen to be their top four. So all things that are in the news all the time, no big surprise, it's on their minds. <clears throat> so that what we will be talking about a little now and more tomorrow is how can you discuss issues without veering into partisan, partisan um, lanes. The other thing is the opposite of what we just talked about. Instead of thinking that their vote doesn't make a difference, thinking about the ways their vote can sway an election or college students as a block, um, the power that their vote has to make a difference, that motivates them. So talking to them about how close our elections in Wisconsin are, the, these elections, um, the top, you know, the main elections at the top of the ballot in November are going to be decided by tiny, tiny margins. Wisconsin is a truly purple state. We're about 50-50 when it comes to voters. So um, this is gonna make a big difference. It is not an exaggeration to say that on any one UW campus, that number of students alone could sway the election. So, um, you know, it's, it is very important for you to express to students how much power their vote really has. Some of this is because a lot of them are new voters. So it makes a big difference. We're pulling in a whole bunch of new voters. Our, you know, my, my dream is, can we get turnout in this election that matches or close comes close to matching the turnout in a presidential year? You know, we're always talking about every year, every vote. We should be, you know, treating every election like it's the important election and not just every four years or not even just every two years. So um, talking about what a difference everyone's votes makes is very motivating. Having convenient resources, a lot of this is stuff that Carmen just um, talked about, all these different resources and ways to, um, to be in touch with students and asking them questions. Um, they want, you know, now I will say this, contrary to what I hear from a lot of students that they get too many emails and they never read their emails, what the students said to the focus group um, instructors was they want resources sent to them either in emails or texts from student affairs. They specifically said student affairs, maybe because they get so many, they only wanna to have to look at certain ones that have easy links, easy instructions, easy resources. Um, you know, and this, you know, makes a lot of sense. This is how almost everyone wants their information, right? Accessible, sent right to them, simple instructions. If there is um, a photo of something that you're talking about, like, you know, this, like when I was talking about this is where on the ballot, you have to make sure your witness um, uh, puts their contact or puts their address before you mail in your ballot. Um, a picture of what that looks like is handy. Videos, um, hopefully you all aren't afraid to make videos with your phones. It does not have to be fancy. It's actually even more effective if it's just you and your phone saying, I just registered to vote and it took five minutes and this is how I did it. Um, easy, easy instructions. Uh, some of the campuses, not, not a lot, but some of them, the larger campuses will have uh, their clerks actually come to campus and have early voting days, have registration days. Um, that's really amazing. Make sure you're in touch with whoever on campus is in charge of scheduling that. And um, I, we really encourage all of you as fellows and as campus administrators to touch base with your clerks, you know, call them up and, you know, introduce yourself. If you don't already know, find out when they're going to be on campus so you can tell people. 
Um, early voting stations exact are possible in some areas, not all. Um, but this is something that, again, just makes it really, really easy. Um, and lastly, those empowering messages, um, the empowering messages can, it, can motivate students to vote. When they hear empowering messages from anyone on social media, on billboards, in posters on campus from other people, that does get them starting to get motivated about voting. Um, so before we go to a break, uh, what are some of these empowering messages that you can think of or have heard that you thought were particularly good? I have actually, um, uh, can everyone hear me okay? I switched yeah. to my AirPods and sometimes they sound weird. Okay, I've actually uh, found that looking up the margin of victory for your like local house race or even like state senate race, and then uh, comparing it to either your campus enrollment size or even sometimes your average class size gets crazy. I was gonna say effing crazy, <laughs> like it is <laughs> very close. So, you know, take a minute, go on Ballotpedia and check out the margin of victory for the last few races or whatever, and check out the your average class enrollment or your class size. And you'll find, I bet you'll find the numbers are like, it's not only that your school, your school can win a race, your school can flip a race. Absolutely. Anyone else, what's an empowering message that you either heard? Maybe it's a meme that you saw that you thought, actually, that's really good. <laughs> and Matt, yes, I did see what you put in the chat. <laughs> I was gonna chime in. Um, I just dropped another link in our chat to, um, so we started doing this a couple of years ago. It's like a last ditch final effort. Here's everything in one email location. Um, that we send out to all of our um, traditional undergraduate students and hopefully expanding a little bit here this fall. Um, but this is like the one-stop shop message that we send to all of our students as, as, on election day or nearing election day. Um, it's not designed to be the like end all be all, but is designed to have a lot of links and a lot of information there. Um, so we design that in MailChimp. Um, so if you have questions about that or you want to steal the verbiage in there, please take it. Um, like, please take it. Don't recreate. Like, just steal it. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> and you'll also note my our like fun fact that stretches that our students vote in two different municipalities because our campus is in two different municipalities. So yes, um, really exciting stuff for tra training residents to go to the right place. So um, feel free. And then, and, um, as always, like reach out, let us know. Poor Cardinals, Cardinal Stretch, I use you as example all the time of some of the things that, you know, nobody really intended, but it does make it more challenging to help students vote. At half every you live turn. in Fox Point, the other half live in Glendale. <laughs> at every turn, at every turn. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, motivation, come on. How about this? Do any of you remember a, a, a meme or a, or a social media campaign or something that motivated you to do anything? Not necessarily vote, but anything. And if you say NyQuil chicken, I'm gonna kick you off of this Zoom. <laughs> I, I heard something in one of my videos when I was doing homework this morning. And it said, it is harder to, to be kind than it is, wait a minute. <laughs> Find it. It is, it is harder to be kind than to be clever. And that kind ah. of- Kindness motivates. There you go. Anyone else? We don't want it to be hard, but it shouldn't be that hard for you to be kind. Come on, man. Everyone who's helping other people register to vote, I'm giving you all kindness points. 
<laughs> All right, um, Abby, I know you just joined us, but we are gonna take a little bit of a break. Um, it's 227, let's just take a three minute stand up, stretch, get a glass of water, do whatever you need to do. And I will see you at 2.30. Resume recording and share my screen. <clears throat> so we will practice some more tomorrow with these kind of motivational messages um, and ideas about social media campaigns and other kinds of events. But uh, glad we had a little opportunity to think about that. Um, now, you all have heard me say, and heard Noah say, and heard Cassie say, and heard all of us say a million times that we are pro-voter, but we must remain nonpartisan. And I just wanted to kind of explain um, what that means. And, um, you know, other than because we just love democracy, why are we so uh, concerned about this? And um, all of these things apply to your campuses as well, which is why they in, in addition to just the fact that they want everyone to vote and register to vote legally, we really have to stay in our lane. So the Campus Vote Project and the Fair Election Center, which is our um, parent corporation, are, is a public charity under the IRS code 501c3. If you uh, continue in this work and you get a job um, with an advocacy group or a nonprofit of some other kind, you're gonna hear this a lot. C3s and C4s and C27s and all, or 527s and all of these different kinds of organizations. Um, but what does that actually mean? This is what it means. <clears throat> so can you all see the website here? I hope I did that right, I think so. Um, a 501c3 charity is a public charity for whom donations are tax deductible. So that means if I give a donation to the Fair Election Center, I get a tax deduction for making that donation. The Fair Election Center on their part does not pay taxes, it's tax exempt. Um, as a public charity, it can do very limited lobbying for or against legislation very limited support or opposition to ballot measures. Um, and everything it does has to be um, nonpartisan and cannot focus on a particular candidate. If you're a C4, uh, you can do more unlimited lobbying and unlimited ballot um, support or opposition. Main difference being as a C4, your main mission has to be something that is charitable and for the social welfare, but you can do 49% of your stuff can be actually about getting someone elected or opposing a candidate or opposing a ballot issue. You will come into contact with students on your campus who are working for 501c4 organizations. There are also lots of organizations, big ones that you all have heard about, the ACLU, the Human Rights Campaign, um, uh, gun measure campaigns, I'm trying to think of all of them now, um, that have C3 and C4 sides both. So some of those, like the, the League of Conservation uh, Voters is another one. They, are, they have student interns on campuses who are working on their C4 side. So you might see some friends that are promoting specific candidates because they're working in that C4 lane. We are all working in the C3 lane. So we cannot do the same thing as some of the other student interns can do. Um, we are all about democracy. We are all about making sure everyone is registered to vote. We are all about just, you know, engagement in, um, in voting and democracy and, and our con constitutional rights. So um, just a few things here. 
if you want to educate um, candidates on issues, you must offer that information to all the candidates. So as fellows, if you would like to do a survey of students, find out what's important to them, and then offer that information to candidates or your elected officials and say, I thought you might be interested in learning what people on our campus care about. You have to give it to all of the candidates or all of the elected officials. You cannot just pick one party or another. Um, if you want to sponsor a debate, you have to invite all of the candidates and make sure that they are given equal opportunities. The good example of this was uh, Carroll University last spring did a um, debate, well, it wasn't really a debate, it was a forum for school board candidates. It was very challenging to make sure all of them could come or um, if even if they got almost all of them, that would have been okay, but you have to invite all of them. You have to make sure you've discussed the options with all of them. If someone, you know, isn't available and they know they were asked and they were given every opportunity and they can't make it, okay, fine. But you really truly have to try to get everyone there. It is difficult sometimes because their schedules are crazy, but you really have to give equal opportunity to everyone. Um, if you distribute voter guides, um, which you know it's possible we could figure out how to do our own voter guide, um, we have to make sure that the candidates views are expressed on a broad range of issues and that you are you are uh, showing the views of both candidates in an unbiased way. So you can't like have a thing where you're like, oh, here's candidate A and candidate B. Candidate A loves puppies, candidate B hates puppies. Like you can't, you have to make it seem like you are honestly putting that person's position out in a way that they would un, they would appreciate what you said. It doesn't have to be um, like you're, you know, um, seeming like you're promoting that candidate or that issue. It just has to be unbiased, not use words that make it very clear that you're really trying to push the voter one way or another. And we can talk again more in detail about that tomorrow when we're all together in person. You cannot, this is a big X here, we cannot distribute voter guides that compare candidates on issues of importance. C4s can do that, C3s cannot. So if you wanted to say, here's a, um, a voter guide that just has all the information, here's the candidates, here's where you can find out more about them, vote411.org, their websites. Um, I don't know, we would see if we can find some other ones. Um, you know, just so that someone can see who's running, you can do that. You cannot, or you could do just generally, here's a million different issues um, that the candidates um, are concerned about. You can't say, we all are, we're a charity that goes, that talks about clean water. So we're only gonna say this candidate thinks this about clean water, this candidate thinks that about clean water. It makes it seem like too much like you are steering someone toward a specific candidate. I know that's a little squishy, um, but honestly, if we can't figure out a way to give you a printed guide or a virtual guide that has this exactly right, I'd rather not do it and let um, the students go to vote411.org, which is a website run by the League of Women Voters, or um, we'll see if one of the campuses maybe puts out um, an unbiased voter guide. Uh, apparently the University of Wisconsin um, at Madison did that several years ago and are looking at doing it again. And it, we'll find out about that and um, see if we can send that out to you. Um, there's other stuff here that um, doesn't really apply to you guys, but um, one of the things we can do, both, both kinds of organizations can do, is conduct nonpartisan get out the vote activities and voter registration and education. This is the biggest part of what we do is, and by nonpartisan, what we mean is anyone who approaches you and says, I would like information about how to register to vote, you have to help them. You can't say, well, who are you planning to vote for? <laughs> and then decide whether or not you're gonna help them register. 
everybody, you don't even bring up parties, doesn't matter. We are, at, we are registering folks to vote if they want to register to vote. We are telling them when the election is, when early voting is, we are educating them about how to vote. We're doing all of those things without even asking them what any of their preferences are because it doesn't matter. What we cannot do also is voter registration or GOTV, that is a term you'll use a lot. GOTV stands for get out the vote. Um, activities based on party affiliation. Although again, you cannot do, um, you cannot do a watch party where with say the college Dems, where everybody is cheering for just the democratic candidates. You can't have campus vote project fellows and college Dems alone working together on a party. You can, if you know that college Dems and college Republicans say are both holding watch parties, you can tell students, you know, both of the clubs on campus are holding parties, you might want to look into it, you can tell them that, but you cannot coordinate with either one of the partisan type groups on campus. Um, so if you have any, any, any questions, and you're not sure about something someone's invited you to help with, definitely ask me or Noah, because we have to stay in our lane. Um, voter, Nonpartisan voter protection activities. This again is something we're gonna be talking more about with our fellows, which is the um, voter, um, sorry, poll observing program, either on your own or through the League of Women Voters. You can be trained to be an election observer where you just go to a polling place, check in with the chief election inspector, and then watch and make sure that all of the rules around voting are being followed. Um, you can do that. And we are there as a nonpartisan protection, um, voter protection person. Um, that doesn't, and this again, big, huge, huge. We do not endorse candidates, period. You will never ever see something that says this candidate was endorsed by the Fair Election Center or the Campus Vote Project. Never gonna happen. C4s can do that. So again, if you've got friends on campus who are working for the League of Conservation Voters or Planned Parenthood or the ACLU or some other organizations that have a C4 side or even more strong, they have a PAC, Political Action Committee, um, or they're working directly for the parties or the candidates, they will, they can straight up say, um, the, you know, the human rights campaign is endorsing this candidate and we're having an event for you to come and meet that candidate. That is a perfectly fine thing for them to do. That is not something we will do. So, um, so I'm not saying that you as a person couldn't go to that event. If you hear about that event, knock yourself out. But you can't say, I'm here from the Campus Vote Project and we endorse this candidate too. No, 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 cannot do it. Um, independent expenditures is not something you have to worry about. We are not giving any money to any candidates. Nope, not doing it. Uh, we're not paying for anything to do with those candidates. Uh, we're not doing any of this stuff. <laughs> we're certainly not asking candidates to sign pledges on issues. We're not posting partisan political messages on our social media. Um, you guys, if you would like to post something partisan and it is not while you're working as a fellow, you can, but you need to put on your social media bio that your personal opinions are not those of the Campus Vote Project or the Fair Election Center um, to make it very, very clear. If you wanna, if, if it's midnight and you're poking around on your phone and you wanna say something partisan about a candidate, I can't stop you from doing that. You have free speech rights, but I can stop you from doing it while you are acting as a fellow which means you are tabling. You are calling these, like you've set aside these hours, you consider these your work hours. Don't do anything partisan while you're working. Um, okay, are there any questions about that? 
I know it seems really squishy and the line seems very blurry sometimes. Yes, Brianna. Yes, so the vote 411 website is a common one that's been shared in like the all in challenge and all the other, you know, I I see that all the time and and often refer students to that, but a lot of there is one party of candidates and most of them have not responded to the questions on that website. So really I it's not a source for students to see both sides right now. Any thoughts on what we could recommend as an alternative? Yeah. There is that is that is a true statement. <laughs> It is very unfortunate. What they, what I've been told, and I honestly haven't checked this recently, but that in the place of, for some of the candidates who did not respond to the survey questions, they do list their social media accounts and their websites. So a student could go on there and go directly to their websites and hopefully see some ideas or policy, policy positions. You can also go to their social media and see a lot more you know, current information. Sometimes, honestly, just Googling them, what's been in the news lately. Another one I would send folks to is PolitiFact. PolitiFact has a website. I think it's politifact.org, where they have tons of information about candidates on from every stripe that they have fact-checked with real journalists. So um, if somebody wonders, you know, if some statement a candidate supposedly made is true, you can look that up on PolitiFact. Um, there is another one called Ballot Ready. I think they have some information. You're nodding now, okay. Um, so, you know, you might wanna poke around a little. I will say as we get closer to the election, local newspapers often try to do a version of a comparison. Um, so you can, um, and direct students to that wasn't created by us. Um, if it really seems fair, usually journalists, real journalists, try very hard to create some kind of a fair and unbiased comparison of candidates as we get closer to the election. Um, <clears throat> so that might help. The other thing, excuse me, that you can do is you know, it's not always going to work, but invite the candidates to come to the to the campus and let the students hear from them in person. You know, I really wish they would do that more often. But, um, you know, actually meeting a candidate can often, you know, just really, it gives you an idea of who they are as a person more as I think someone was talking, uh, Matt, I think was saying, you know, seeing them as real people and hoping that you can have a real conversation that isn't gonna be just talking points would be nice. The other thing is sometimes if a candidate can't come, they will send a surrogate, someone who works very closely with their campaign and, can, and has official uh, permission to speak for the candidate. But I know this is hard. Um, you know, It used to be that those surveys were filled out by all of the candidates and you could see the side-by-side -side answers um, this is something where um, I, if I find any other resource that is excellent, I will send it out to all of you. If you find something that you think is an excellent resource, please let us know and we can share that out. That actually leads me to a follow-up question, one that I heard about in another webinar and haven't really used with students yet, um, but I poked around a little bit, was the I stand with or I side with quiz, which basically it, you you respond to a bunch of issue questions with your own values, and then it draws up candidates whose values align. I don't know. Has anyone used that with students? And what? How did that go? Uh, personally, that? I, I love that quiz. I think it's absolutely amazing, and I always highly recommend it to anyone if they're trying to figure out, um, you know, like who they're going to vote for. Like you can always find semi decent political quizzes that will talk about like you know, what, what candidate for president, you know, you most side with and stuff like that. But I side with does an amazing job of finding local candidates as well and giving you details on them. And then you can really adapt the quiz a lot to kind of what you really care about and what matters to you. And I do think it's like very accurate and very fair as well and extremely detailed. Oh yeah. I very much support that quiz. 
Excellent. That is really good to hear. Anyone, Matt? Um, I have used that in previous kind of terms as well. Um, I think one of the things that's really great about that too is um, if you're working with students with for that, it's like their first time voting, um, they are, which is many students and most students, depending on colleges and programs and whatnot, um, I think it can be really good for them to begin to see candidates and elections as um, not just single party um, kind of operational pieces, right? Where it's like, oh yeah, well, I kind of do have a maybe a nuanced feeling about that and or I feel really strongly about this one issue. Um, and so I think it's good to just begin to help them pick that apart for themselves too. And understanding that like you can have a strong feeling about this one issue but you have a lot of other feelings that may resonate with another candidate or a different party. Um, and that's like a good opportunity for good, like learning and discernment about um, the role of politics, right. And like how they can um, like voting as a bus and not as a car, right. Like you're not necessarily trying to get exactly to the thing that you want to get to, but you got to get close enough to the person that and the destination that you're hoping for. That is a really good reminder, um, Matt. I know a lot of people get frustrated when they hear a candidate's positions on things or all of the candidate positions and they always say, I can't find someone who thinks the way I do. None of these candidates really you know, get me. None of them are gonna be perfect, but get as close as you can. Um, because this person, again, is supposed to be representing your voice. Does that always work? No, people are not perfect, but get as close as you can. Yeah, the bus not car metaphor is a very good one. Any other comments on this subject? Any other confusions that you can think of right now about we, what we are and are not allowed to do? All right, if anything comes up, you can always ask us. If I have a still fuzzy you know, um, question about it, I'll, I can send it up to the lawyers at the Fair Election Center and they will give us an opinion. So um, we're offering that resource too. All right, let's go back to the screen. Um, and back to this. So now that we know all of that, we know what motivates students, we know what doesn't motivate students, we know what we are allowed to do or not do. What kinds of events or social media campaigns are we going to plan? Now, yeah, I, know, I realize it is what, the 23rd of September. <laughs> we have like, like elections in six weeks, don't panic. But um, if you're planning, you probably, a lot of you are planning events on campus already. You still have time to plan events. You certainly have time to plan social media campaigns, especially fellows. You could make your own little social media campaign on your own accounts. Um, I just threw some of the dates out here because we've got National Voter, Edu Voter Education Week coming up um, starting October 3rd. It's just an excuse to, you know, there's going to be a lot of attention on social media from all of the organizations like ours telling you that it's National Voter Education Week throwing out little nuggets of education here and there, um, do all of these things. Um, so, you know, you might, you have to do something during that week. I mean, I think you do because otherwise it looks like you're ignoring it. Um, there is a debate among the gubernatorial candidates on October 14th, that's a Friday. It's happening in Madison. So those of you who are in Madison, um, we can try to figure out how you become part of that audience. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows that answer already, if they're gonna try to fill that auditorium with students, if they're gonna hand out tickets. Sometimes the candidates are given tickets that they're allowed to share to their supporters and then they fill with students at the university. Not sure, but the point is that Friday night is a good time to have a debate watch party. Again, you can have a debate watch party. You cannot say we're going to come. Oh, you know, we're going to 
have this debate watch party so we can all cheer on one person or the other. Um, it would be best if you're going to actually host a debate watch party, if you invite a broad selection of students and hope that you get you know, uh, some good camaraderie um, going on there and people really thinking about and discussing the answers of the candidates. If you have any questions about that, um, we can talk more about that um, tomorrow too. So that's an excuse to do an event. There might also be debate watch parties um, that other groups are hosting on campus. Um, so you can decide whether you wanna attend just as yourself um, and not as a fellow, or you can certainly just tell people about the other debate watch parties that are going on. Early voting begins in Wisconsin on October 25th. So any kind of walk to the polls, march to the polls, early voting pushes that you want to do, you can start doing them October 25th. National Vote Early Day is October 28th. If you'd like to wait, that is a Friday, I believe. If you wanna wait for that Friday and do a walk to the poll, um, uh, we talked during our election law training about what you can and cannot offer to people when you're inviting them to come with you and go to the polls. You cannot um, give them something of value or <laughs> God forbid, pay them to go with you to vote. But you can do little things like if you're going to say, hey, we're all meeting up at such and such a you know, place and then we're going to walk over to City Hall and vote and you're going to have hot chocolate um, or tea or something for everyone to sip while they're walking. That's OK. Does not have a large value. And if anyone walks up and says, I want my hot chocolate, but I'm not going to go with you, you just give them the hot chocolate anyway. It's fine. So things like that. We like those events. Um, just so you know, early voting, of course, ends on November 4th, which is a uh, Friday. I said ish because for the big in the big cities, especially Milwaukee and Madison, you may have early voting still on that Saturday, November 5th. You will not be able to register to vote on the 5th, but you might have early voting hours um, because that is up to the clerk. Um, and then there will be apparently three debates between Mandela Barnes and Ron Johnson. I am not sure um, what those dates are yet, but we will make sure you know, because again, those are opportunities to um, not only you know, host a debate thing for yourself or as a fellow uh, debate watch party, but you can also just tell people uh, on your social media or when you're talking to folks, maybe put posters up or whatever, just so that if they, if, a, if any student really wants to watch that debate to help them make up their mind, um, they, you need to tell them when that's available. The debates are usually available on video afterwards, but it's kind of more fun to watch it in person. Um, so having said that, now we are going to, I'm gonna stop sharing and let's just talk about events. So this is, Here's everybody. Events, guys. What ideas do you have? What plans do you already have in place? Garrett, do you have something in your action plan already for any of these things? Uh, yeah, so we've got uh, three on-campus voter registration opportunities with the clerk uh, starting next week. Um, I wanna say, five hours on Tuesday, four hours Wednesday, and five hours on October 3rd. Um, and then we are also exploring um, either a results party uh, or a debate watch party. So one of those two things will be happening. Um, it really depends on how quickly we can mobilize folks across campus. Um, you know, Time is time is flying by here, uh, and so a debate watch party might not be as feasible as we hope at this point. Anyone else, Brianna? Yeah, we are doing um, voter registration at multiple campuses during National Voter Education Week in partnership with the League of Women Voters. Um, we're also going to do an event that I totally stole from some other community colleges. Um, it's called Breakfast and Ballots and we'll, we'll feed you free breakfast. And then um, we'll have computer stations and iPads set up where they can either check out the 
I side with, I hope, or vote for when, like, first of all, what is on your ballot? What do those people do? Like Secretary of State, for example, or other positions that might be less familiar. And then, um, and then exploring candidate stances. And we have a lot of students on our campuses who are not eligible to vote for either age or citizenship or justice involved reasons. And we're being really clear that everyone can come to these events just to understand what, who these candidates are and what they do, even if you aren't gonna be able to vote for them. That sounds great. Taryn? Yes, so right now I'm collaborating with some other interns at Badger's Boat and we are exploring a newsletter. We're working on a newsletter to send out for the students. We're thinking about doing some interviews with students, talking about their reasons for voting, why they go out to the polls, maybe talk about why some students might be hesitant, exploring that too. I know I personally for the newsletter am working on a sample ballot, uh, providing that, talking about the different positions that are on the ballot and where <clears throat> students who might not be voting in Madison can find what their ballot looks like. And then I also am exploring with collaborating with the Wisconsin Alumni Student Board, another organization on campus that's not a voting organization, but working with them to maybe do a presentation about voting and things like that. So just kind of starting to get the ball rolling, mostly on the newsletter. I'm glad you both are bringing up the point of like, just seeing the ballot the name and the position is one thing. What does that even mean? What is the position? You know, what does the attorney general actually have control over or not? And what does the secretary of state in Wisconsin do? It's different than in other states, the treasurer, et cetera. That's, um, it's really good to understand all those things. Bethany, did you have something? Yeah, my main thing right now, my main focus has been I'm creating a series of we call them leader shops. So I'm creating a couple of like presentations, ones for like, we're inviting like everyone on campus, but it's targeted towards like people who like student org leaders, people who might frequently get asked about, like, it's just basically, how do you register to vote? What are the deadlines? Why is this race important? In other words, who's on the ballot and just kind of emphasizing the importance of local elections. And then how do you vote on elections? Like, how do you vote? And I'm doing that one time for that. And I'm actually doing it next week to the RAs on campus because they field a lot of those questions. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Who else has something that they've already planned? Uh, we have a lot of things in the world. Oh, a lot. <laughs> oh, I won't get into all of them. It's a lot. It's a little bit stressful, but it's important. Um, I mean, we're starting to get the ball rolling on some classroom presentations for voter registration. Um, we have a really fun event planned for Vote Early Day. We're actually celebrating on Halloween instead of Vote Early Day. And we're doing like a sort of like a trick or vote inspired things focused on like uh, Halloween is scary, but elections don't have to be. Um, and we're we actually have a early voting now on campus. It's a, a new thing. So woo, we love that for uh, UW Milwaukee. So that is good gonna, to know. Yeah, uh, we're really going to push that um, hand out candy. It'll be fun. Um, we're also going to do some like get out the vote stuff sort of focused on like, you know, don't forget to vote like donut forget to vote very cute uh we're going for really like fun and playful stuff on our campus that's sort of my like goal for this year is to like make voting less intimidating um and try to make it like a lot more fun um so yeah those are some of the things we're doing by the way i'm just gonna say if you all can steal from each other i'm gonna give you permission yeah, feel free <laughs> <laughs> thank you taryn we'll see you tomorrow um Matt, anything on Stretch? Yeah, um, I, Garrett, thank you for reminding me. I We actually at Stretch just signed on to Why Bother Wisconsin as well a um, couple in the last couple of weeks here. Um, and so cool to work on that. So we've actually started working. Our student government is very interested in making some movement to encouraging our faculty and our administration to change voting day to be a day off of classes and a day on for civic engagement. Love, um, love. So we're really starting to make some pieces on that. Um, I know I just pull, pulled up William's schedule here. So um, he's gonna be shy and can chime in if he wants to. Um, but one of the things that kind of to play on the Halloween stuff, cause we have vote early, um, the grant through MTV too. Um, and so we're going to do a voting booth um, and we're going to try to track down um, a like an, a voting booth like from one of the polling sites 
hopefully, um, and like set it up in the middle of our union. And the one of the like the riff is like we're gonna want to put up like black pipe and drape around it, and it's like a little haunted house, um, <laughs> and encourage people to like peek behind the curtain. Um, but also one of the strategies I think we're adopting this fall, and we're gonna finalize a lot of these more. Uh, in the next week or so. Um, but we're trying to identify other larger campus events and then going to the people that are doing those and then putting up tables there. Um, so things like a lot of our on-campus sporting events, um, a lot of stuff throughout like our mission week coming up in October, um, stuff related to like midterms and our like therapy dog night kind of stuff that's always super popular with students. Um, so trying to identify those pieces and then kind of building stuff that is present there so we're not having to draw people specifically just to do voting things um, because it can be a little challenging to try to get them to come to something that's just like come and get a thing and do a vote stuff um, it's just like not very like like sexy <laughs> um, and I think like the therapy dogs on our campus is like one of the most popular events every fall and it's every part I love that everyone's got a therapy dog um, it is the the biggest thing and so it's like yes of course we're going to table at that event to make sure that the students who are there for the therapy dogs are also getting voter information so for those of you who have done my election law training that is one of the things that I encourage you to do is crash other events and by crash, I mean, do tell them, ask them if you can come. But, <laughs> but if there's already gonna be people there for a different reason, excellent place to show up and either table or just hand out information or do whatever you can to your captive audience. Um, Matt and Abby, what's going on in lacrosse? So we have planned for Voter Education Week. Um, we are going to be in all the residence halls. We're trying to hit two halls every single day. And awesome. we're currently working that out with the hall directors right now. Um, another thing that we have planned um, sometime late October, just in time for vote early day, um, we're going to do voter bingo, which had a good turnout last year for us. And we're hoping with more planning, we'll be able to advertise it more and get more involvement from everybody on campus. And then I think the other one that could be in the works is we're gonna hopefully do something that incorporates free hot chocolate on election day. So, cause you know, it's, it'll be November, it's gonna be cold and free stuff always gets students to turn out. So that's another one that we're thinking about. How about Stevens Point or Western? What do you all have in mind? So we've been doing tons of tabling events and just being out and involved in our campus. And uh, well, now after listening to some of the ideas, we're going to be doing those too. Definitely. Good. <laughs> uh, yes, we encourage major plagiarism um, <laughs> just among events, not in your papers. Julie and Sally, anything going on at Western? Uh, yeah, we we don't have a lot of events planned yet. A lot of ideas <laughs> we need to kind of set in stone the the dates. We do have the League of Women Voters coming on October 12th um, and they're doing something with our Women's Initiative Network. Um, and then basically I wanna just try to, you know, tag on to a lot of the different events that are happening on campus. We have a Halloween event that's happening at the Res Hall. Um, we have some well-rounded wellness Thursdays that are happening every Thursday. We have a wellness fair that's coming up. Um, there's some free bowling nights, um, mm. affinity spaces. We have leadership night. Um, so lots of different events that I think we can tag on to. Um, it's just kind of figuring that out. And a lot of the things that people have shared today, I am like writing down because I think that they're all great ideas. That so is I the whole that. point of the summit for you to get ideas. That's exactly right. Sally, do you have anything to add? Any thoughts? Uh, well, a lot of what Julie said, because we've also been chatting back and forth, but I'm also part of student government. So I was oh. going to see if I could piggyback on some of, I'm the campus events coordinator. Perfect. So I was going to see if I can help piggyback a little bit on some of our activities. Perfect, perfect. Kiara, what's going on at Carol? 
Um, we don't have anything planned yet. A lot of ideas. We are meeting on Tuesday with another uh, group on Carol, like on campus. It's called Unpack, and they're really like kind of doing the same thing. So we thought with Erica that isn't here that we could meet with them and just like influence each other and give each other's ideas. We're gonna go um, into classes to talk, but. We don't have um, real plans for now. Okay, well, Noah will be able to give you lots of great ideas. Yes, <laughs> he's really helpful. <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot more about this tomorrow. Are you you're coming tomorrow, right? No, I unfortunately I can't come tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, don't worry. We'll we'll make sure you know. Um, um, Thank we, you. Noah and I both live like within minutes of Carroll University. So yeah, <laughs> we have no problem coming to campus and doing a brainstorm session with you guys. Yeah, no, definitely. I would love that. Um, Christian, what's going on at Marquette? I know you have a big group of student voting champions there. Um, sure, sure, so there, there, there is a lot, a lot of activity. activity. I was actually just, just in a meeting um, with, with my, uh, Mark, it's, it's, it's called Marquette Votes. Um, <laughs> we have a cyber I'm in the I'm in the meeting. Um, um, there. Uh, sorry. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So one of the things that we have planned right now is kind of uh, just kind of um, off, off similar to the last idea was going into classes that freshmen are in. Um, we kind of figured that it would be kind of smart and advantageous to. Um, kind of take advantage of that that uh, freshman urge to to be involved in, in grown people stuff, and so uh, we we've all been there. And I think voting is just one of those things that you, uh, when you're younger and, and already want to be civically engaged, you can't you can't wait to do it. That's one of the uh, kind of landmarks of, of adulthood. And so we're kind of going into the freshman classrooms, and, and next year we're going to try and take advantage of the orientation. And, uh, anything else that we can do in a, in a larger city setting, uh, which is an opportunity that a lot of campuses just don't have, um, we're going to try and take advantage of that too. That is a really good point. The whole thing of, you know, the you're eight, you know, you're 18 now, you're out of college, you're an adult, you register to vote. It's the next thing you do, right? Um, so I liked uh, that's one of those motivating messages, Christian, that we were talking about. The whole concept of you're, you know, you're a a full adult citizen now and voting is one of the things we all rely on you to do so and you're right there's going to be a lot of events going on with Marquette votes a lot of things going on um, with marches to Pfizer forum um, Pfizer forum where the bucks play is going to be an early voting spot in Milwaukee so um, there will be some I think you're going to do a march to the forum on the 25th and you know, whatever excuses you can take to um, make it fun to go early vote, do it. Um, all right, anyone else want to chime in on events or any other ideas? What about social media? Is anyone planning specific social media campaigns or themes? Do all the campuses have special social media accounts? or voting. Christian. Uh, yes, yeah, so since we have a bigger group, uh, the, the groups got kind of sectioned off and I'm, I'm kind of taking the head a little bit on uh, on social media overall. And so uh, one of the things that Noah actually just shared with me the, the other day when, when we were having a meeting was uh, My Vote Wisconsin, um, which yes. everybody's probably familiar with, but just kind of reiterating that you can literally just look up whether or not you're registered to vote. Um, and move on from there, just kind of pushing that link everywhere, whether it be through QR codes or whatever it, it, it may be. And then also uh, he, he mentioned that it, um, it's, it's pretty smart to know your, know your ward and everything, um, know who to ask if there, if there are questions that, that you have that, uh, or that were asked of you that you can't answer. Um, and just guiding people uh, towards the CBP website too, because there are a lot of uh, resources for each state, not just Wisconsin. Um, so just kind of making people aware of those links uh, has, has been our kind of big thing so far. Excellent. Bethany. Not as much social media that we have a specific plan for yet, but going off of like having those links available, I had a plan on campus with our voting center on campus and we're going to like try to get posters made with like the link for like My Vote Wisconsin and 
and maybe like vote for one one and just like QR codes for that and have them put up around ideally both the residence halls and then the academic buildings just so that it's easily accessible everywhere for people to find the information. One of the things that um, the administrator at Marquette told me about yesterday was they're going to print, you know, those coffee sleeves that you put around a coffee cup so that it's not too hot. They're going to print the uh, QR code of my vote on a sticker and put it on those coffee sleeves. Love it. Very clever. Table tents in the main dining room. You could even print the QR code on a napkin, I bet, or on a coaster. Um, I mean, put that thing everywhere. I'll give $1,000 for the first person who gives who gets a QR code for my vote tattooed on them. <laughs> and well, I'm serious, I will too. That, that would be amazing. Fires, Kristen. But not you, Noah. Anyone but you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine? That would be hilarious. You need to register to vote. Here you go. Maybe we should get temporary tattoos. Oh QR my God! Codes really unfortunately funny. expire after a while, so that oh, tattoo shoot. is gonna go to waste really quickly. All right, it'll have to be the URL. <laughs> actually, I kind of like that idea. Not the tat to actual tattoo, although if anyone actually did that, it would be hilarious. But temporary tattoos of the my vote URL or the QR code or something would actually be really funny. We should see if we can get those made. It would be good. I know we had unrelated to voting, but we had like voting a voting table set up at our SNC day last weekend. And we had like some like stuff for kids. So like candy and temporary tattoos and the number of like college students who just grab temporary tattoos, like that would go over well. All right, I'm writing it down. I just got a grant. I'm giving a bunch of it away to you all, but temporary tattoos, we're doing it. Kristen, you can buy those in like bulk for really cheap too. yeah i bet like i'm just thinking about like and you can get them without water now too like how does that work they, they're like sticky they're, they're basically just like little like stickers that fade away on your skin like it's <laughs> it's a thing i know we we did them at Summerfest last year for like our our marketing department got a bunch of them not for the qr code for the my vote um even though as much as i would love that um, you see, it's the student activities people. I know y'all come through here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you can get them that you don't need to have the water, which makes it even better for if you have a link to where you got those from, send it to me. Uh yeah, let me look. <clears throat> All right, this is fun, you guys. What else? What now it's just any idea you have in the world. I don't care if it events, social media, campaigns, billboards. What do you got? I, we're going to try and get the administrators at my college to do um, an I vote because video and then our some of the, the students who are volunteering I'm hoping that we can have little I vote because sheets um, at the tabling probably end of October maybe a week before the election and create just campus bulletin boards with everyone's motivations for voting and I'm really hoping we can get the administrators to to play or even just some campus celebrities um, that we have some of the people at our welcome center everybody knows them and would love to have them participate too in that video um, for social media. I'm pretty sure that it was in 2020 the UW Badger votes <clears throat> did a I vote because video with a bunch of students. Um, so yeah, any of you can do that. And again, it's something that's really easy to do on your phone now. And um, you could just, yeah, um, just collect a bunch of them and splice them together. And that's a great social media campaign right there. Um, for those of you who are on here who are administrators and didn't see my email yesterday, I really truly am sending all of you $1,000 um, from this amazing donor. So Garrett, Brianna, Matt, um, and Julie. You'll hear from me next week with a um, piece of paper that you can sign and um, we will be re-granting $1,000. <laughs> and Garrett's like, I could because I'm in the hole. Um, <laughs> any other ideas from uh, about how we're gonna get students registered? Paul. There's a couple of things that UW-Madison is doing that might be unique. Yeah. One is they arranged with the city clerk's office uh, to produce uh, 9,000 sheets of paper. Uh, and they're going to put them in the mailboxes for all the students who live in university housing. So oh, on, nice. one side, on one side of the sheet, it's a letter from the university 
with the student's name and address on it. And since the university is a government institution, that becomes a government document that can be used as proof of residence. On the other side, of course, is the registration form. So all they have to do is fill out the form and get that form back to the clerk's office. I love that. Is it worth a thousand dollars? Efficient and makes it that. Remember what we were but actually, Paul. I think before you popped on, we were talking about one of the things that motivates students is if you make it easy, yeah. make it easy for them. Well, and I, I love that. That's item number two that makes it easy for voter ID. UW Madison has set up a website. It's called voteridwisc.edu. <clears throat> easy to remember. If you click on that, it asks you to log in. Students log in using multi-factor authentication. It's very secure. It immediately goes to a page that allows them to, on one click, they can receive a PDF with a acceptable voter acceptable ID on it. So there's no delay. There's no staff member involved. I'm sure it costs them a little bit to set it up, but once you got going, you actually save money because student doesn't have to make a trip to the ID office and to get the acceptable ID, it's easier on staff time and it's instantaneous. If the student wants to request an absentee ballot, they can just use that PDF uploaded at My Vote Wisconsin and it, they're all set. If they, um, if they Matt, need to- before we go to you, um, where, where's Christian? Christian, when you were talking at Marquette about how there's an accessibility issue with where you have to go to get your ID, that would be the solution. So um, it's um, it's possible that we can kind of um, hook you up with some folks at Madison and see if Marquette can duplicate that. Um, if not for this year, maybe for the future. Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds like, like a, a really, really, really good idea. idea. Also, um, if I may add, I think, I think that mailbox idea was, was definitely worth a thousand dollars. Um, Matt, wait, first, what did Garrett say? Insight voter ID pieces presenting new challenges. Okay, let's go to Matt first because you got your hand up and then we'll talk more about voter ID. Yeah, so my question is actually about the voter ID. Okay. Has that changed again? <laughs> and I missed it because I didn't go to the training. So <laughs> um, are we, are they able to use like a printed form like you that? Oh, yeah, they can use, <clears throat> a printed, they can print out their ID themselves and say, this is my ID. And this started um, during COVID when we were trying to figure out how to get a college ID to a student who is not on campus, right? When the campuses were shut right. down. And the Wisconsin Elections Commission said the statute language actually says, you know, an ID given to you by the campus. It does not describe what that ID is. So it doesn't say a piece of plastic. Mm. It can be virtual on your phone or it can be a piece of paper printed out. Man, I that, love the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that does work. Um, I would love to see an example of what that looks like from a school doing it. So either Paul, if you're still around or have an access to it, um, I would love to be able to like go to my IT people and be like, do this like right now, please and thank you. <laughs> Paul, do you think it's possible for us to to have a um, to set up another meeting where some folks from UW explain exactly how this works? I, I can give you on the technical side. I I don't don't know, but I can give you a link to a two minute movie that explains how it works from the user's standpoint. Perfect. Okay, let's start with that. Let me see if I can find that link and put it in the chat. Okay, cool. Perfect, thanks, Paul. Garrett, what issues are you having? Oh. Anybody else before, well, before Sorry. Garrett comes back to us? Oh. Did you, did you ask me a question? You asked me a question, right? I said to anyone, do you have a, I said Garrett. Oh, okay, okay. It sounded like, sorry. My <laughs> but um, it, does anyone else have issues with, getting students the right ID or do any of the students, are you confused about what ID you can use to vote? I'm not confused about what ID I can use to vote, but it's always confusing like trying to tell students, especially since like we're, we work with the campus card office to get them like physical cards since our student IDs don't cover it. So that is super interesting to know that it doesn't necessarily have to be the 
plastic ID and all the cases. I'm really going to have to check out that video. Yeah, I'll send it out to all of you. Christian? Um, yeah, so uh, just to clarify, um, if you have a proof of residence and you're a Wisconsin resident, um, you can bring your you can bring your driver's license, right? As long as you, you can prove, like if you're a college student, for example, um, living on campus, you can like bring a, a document that proves that. And as long as you have your your driver's license, you're good to go, right? Correct. Yep, that's exactly right. the The rule is that you have to, if you're going to use a driver's license or a state ID, it has to be from Wisconsin. So even though your face is the same and you live in Illinois, that's not acceptable. <laughs> but if, so if you're if you are a Wisconsin resident, you have a Wisconsin ID or a Wisconsin driver's license, that will prove who you are. But where you live is the other thing you still need to prove. Um, so yes, that is true. So for instance, if you are a student at a public university and you have that letter like Paul described or any letter from the university or any letter from the government that is mailed to you at your campus address, that is your proof of residence and your driver's license from Wisconsin or your state ID is your proof of identity. Um, Garrett, you're back. What can we do for you? Yeah, sorry about that, y'all. Um, important phone calls coming in. So basically, uh, what I've been able to, able to overhear has been very helpful. Um, we earlier this year uh, lost the person who had institutional knowledge on how to create uh, these voter IDs. Um, and our tech services team is as I'm sure y'all can relate, uh, understaffed and overwhelmed. Uh, and so there has been a bit of a lag in learning how to create those for students. Um, so I was actually having some frantic conversations yesterday uh, because we have a growing wait list of students who have requested these IDs. Um, IT doesn't have a clean process for getting them printed on plastic. Um, and they are also, I found out this morning, worried they're going to run out of, there, there are some cost concerns, right? Like the plastic that we use for our swipe IDs have the microchips embedded. So there are microchip less pieces of plastic that right. we use because they're cheaper. Um, IT isn't sure that they are going to have enough of those for all of our students who might need student IDs. So um, if, if IT was able to create a template behind, and throw it behind a password protected wall or whatever they need to do uh, that students could fill out and then print, I mean, that would solve so many headaches for us. I would, if I were you, and I'm just as an abundance of caution, I would talk to the clerk in Appleton about this and make sure they're aware that this is what you're going to do. And if she has any questions, again, you could tell her that Madison has been doing this for years now. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, I think it could be a game changer. This is one of the issues that students or that campuses have been having is the cost factor here. Um, uh, of having more and more, um, you know, students that need to have this uh, special ID printed. So anything that you can do, I know my own nephew in Madison voted with his ID on his phone from exactly the process that Paul was talking about. Um, and he did, Paul did drop into the chat the little video about how this works. Um, so save that, but again, we'll send you um, we'll send it to you too um, as part of the package post this conference. Brianna. Yeah, so we, we're actually shopping for a new student ID system and, and this is definitely one of the questions that's part of it, but um, a challenge that we have in our current system. So we um, recently adopted a preferred name policy where before a student would only could only have their legal name as their email or anything showing up in their Madison College stuff. Now that's changed except on their student IDs because if we want to be able to print a voter ID that has their legal name on it, the preferred name can't show up on their regular old student ID, which is what we would typically issue. So that has been an equity issue um, at the yes. college. And so then, uh, yeah, I'm, I guess basically we're looking for systems that allow maybe a preferred name on the day-to-day -day use ID and then legal name on the voter ID. So if anyone has recommendations about that, I'd, I'd love those. That is a really, really good point. Um, you have to make it clear to the students that their whatever ID, whatever name is on their voter registration is what has to be on that ID. Um, you know, it can be 
I don't think it would be a huge problem if like the middle initial was missing or something, but if they, when they're getting looked up in the poll books at the election, they have to be able to match the names. So that is a really good point. The other hiccup, and this doesn't come up very often, is that we require photo IDs in order to generate our photo IDs. So like, pretty much most students have some sort of photo ID that, in, and many of them are meet the requirements for voter registration or for voter ID in Wisconsin. Yeah. So, yeah. Life. Any other questions or concerns? Let me look in the chat here once. Um, the League of Women Voters of Dane County has training documents, yes, and one of those members is going to be at the summit tomorrow in Madison. So if you've got more questions there, um, she'll, she's our expert. Um, uh, solve the problem, share the code, yeah, we, let's see. I mean, shoot, maybe we can even get some of these IT people onto a, um, a call with us. We'll see what we can do with that. Oh, and Bethany brings up another good point. City clerks will give, will, will receive from the campus the lists of who lives in the dorms. And that is your proof of residence. So the um, anyone who lives in the dorm on your campus, their name should be in that book already. And then you just show up with your ID uh, and they will look you up in the approved registration book that you yeah. live on campus. But again, that only works if you live on campus in the dorms. Yeah, we're a residential college, so it works pretty well for most of our students because we Good. don't really have, either people live on campus or they live in the Green Bay area and already like vote in the Green Bay area. No, oh, well, good, that helps. It's one little, one I less would, hiccup you have. I would add to that, Kristen, though, it doesn't solve the voter ID problem if no. a student is not from the state of Wisconsin. Correct, correct. So like, that's one of the issues that we have. And the thing that like, is like mind melting for most of the students that we work with, where it's just like, what do you mean? I can't use like, I have to go get another ID. There's this extra step. Which is why I'm so curious about this like online downloaded, printed sign it game, um, because that is super cool. Um, and I can provide a link to that in the email. Right, like that's the other yeah, thing. Like we true. talk about like on-time resources, like having students be able to do the things like right at the moment they wanna be able to do it as opposed to like step through spaces. Like that's a big equity thing too. Like just if a student's not available to go to the ID office when the ID office is open to do the thing, the blah, 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 blah. Like, um, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm watching Paul's video just like, awestruck so I'm Yay. thank you for sharing that and thank you Paul for being here and telling us about that anything else that anyone wants to talk about what is your favorite story that is related to voting or democracy so far this semester a particularly challenging registration you completed, a really great event, Bethany. We kind of did, we worked, we partnered with Coco on a voter registration drive, the Coalition of Voting in Brown County. It was for our involvement fair last week. And one thing I thought was really interesting was one of the people from Coco was like asking like, asking people if they wanted to like do trivia. And then it was like constitution trivia. It was just super, it got people to the table, it got people talking, it got people laughing. It was just, it was really engaging, but also really simple. And I, I just thought that was cool. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else? I wanna end on positive notes. My positive note is Noah, because I could not do all this work by myself this semester, there's no way. So, <laughs> Paul. Well, I have a positive note. Uh, probably some of you will know about this already, but the NBA, National Basketball Association, has decided not to play any games on election night. So that yes. the, the teams, the players, the support staff, and fans all get a chance to vote. They are all going to be playing, the 30 teams are going to be playing the night before, 
with the theme of civic engagement. So, and of course, the Milwaukee Bucks have been very, very proactive about getting people involved. They have, in fact, so the night before the election, he said, mm -hmm. so November 7th, this is a perfect excuse to have a basketball game watching party. It doesn't even have to be, you know, something controversial like a debate. Just have a game watching party and remind everyone to go vote the next day. Super good, fun idea, love it. Um, by the way, I know that um, a couple people and um, uh, Garrett from Lawrence University, before he had to sign off and Matt, I think you all too, responded to um, something that Beloit College started called Why Bother Wisconsin, where they want to kind of ironically, sarcastically ask the question, why should you bother to vote? And then of course answer it that all the reasons that you should. Um, but they are on a mission to get all of the private campuses to let folks have election day off um, every other year for the midterms and the presidential elections. And if not that, at least have it be some kind of a day when it wouldn't be the end of the world if you miss class. And I think Bethany, you said you have an advisement day or something like that on election day. Yes, we have advisement day. So basically they give us two days a semester. It's usually a Tuesday and a Wednesday, like a week apart. And we don't have class. We're supposed to meet with our academic advisors for like 15 minutes. But other than that, like the day is ours. So I think that's super cool that they do that. I know my aunt, like the voting center on campus, we're going to be doing like a pizza party and a kind of having campus safety running a shuttle, hopefully. So it's just a really cool chance because people are still out and about because it's still a weekday, but there's no important classes to get to. Excellent. Really good idea. All right. Anything else that everyone, anyone wants to share? And we will give you 20 minutes of your afternoon back. All right, I think that's it. Thank you all for a really, really interesting, engaging time together. I can't wait to see everyone tomorrow. And I can't wait to see when we see your insult reports in the spring, how many votes you are gonna get out on your campuses um, in October and November. Thank you everybody. And we will see you soon.